Hello and welcome to this webinar on reducing your risk from COVID-19 through lifestyle medicine. I'm Dr. Susan Friedman. I'm a professor of internal medicine and geriatric medicine at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry. I'm also the medical director at Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Group. Rochester Lifestyle Medicine was founded by Dr. Ted Barnett in 2015 in an effort to reduce the worldwide burden of chronic disease. We are living in unique and unsettling times, and it feels oftentimes that it's changing from moment to moment, which oftentimes it is. We wanted to let you know that there is a lot that you can do right here and right now to reduce your risk from this virus. That starts with what you've been hearing about, things like physically distancing yourself, frequent hand washing, not touching your face, but it goes well beyond that to what we think of as the pillars of lifestyle medicine. And so we'd like to review all of that with you in the next several minutes in an effort to empower you to take the steps that you need to reduce your risk from COVID-19. Thank you for watching. Okay, so again, we're going to talk about reducing the risk of COVID-19 through employing the principles of lifestyle medicine. And at Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute, we really believe that knowledge is power. There is a lot that you can do to reduce your risk. And that's why we're talking to you about this today. First, we will talk about the risk from COVID-19. Next, we'll talk about how to limit the risk of getting and spreading COVID-19. You've heard a lot about this on the news recently, but we wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page about that. And then the focus of this webinar will be on how to limit the impact of COVID-19 by using the pillars of lifestyle medicine. We also want to talk to you about an opportunity for additional support through the LIFT program. And just as a caveat, this is a rapidly evolving field, and so it's important to check reliable resources for updates. So to start with the good news, the good news is that for most people who get this virus, the disease is mild or even asymptomatic. And secondly, the significant majority of people who get COVID-19 will recover. But it's important to know that there are groups of individuals who are at increased risk for complications. The first is older adults. And the CDC says that anyone over age 60 is at increased risk. And the older one is, the higher the risk for complications. In addition, people who are on chemotherapy or immunosuppressives, those who have compromised immune systems are also at risk. We don't yet know fully whether or to what extent pregnant women are at risk for complications, but there are some theoretical concerns that suggest that pregnant women would be at higher risk for complications. And we already know and are still learning about the comorbidities that put people at higher risk, in particular, heart disease, lung disease, and diabetes. We don't know for sure yet um, whether high blood pressure is also a risk, but uh, we are learning more about that. So how do we limit the risk of getting COVID-19? In order to do that, we have to know how COVID-19 spreads, and it spreads in two ways. The first is person-to-person -person spread. What that means is close contact or being within six feet of an individual who has the infection, and it can be spread by respiratory droplets through cough or sneeze. Secondly, it can occur from touching a surface that has the virus and then touching your mouth, your nose, or your eyes. And this virus can last for a 
couple of days or more on a hard surface. So, you know, this is what's called a fomite, um, that it can then be a source of infection. And so based on that, in terms of reducing the risk of getting COVID-19, you should avoid close contact with people who are sick, avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands, and wash hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after being in a public place or after blowing your nose or coughing or sneezing. According to the CDC, which is a source of lots of useful information, you should follow these five steps every time that you wash your hands. So you should wet your hands with clean running water, warm or cold, turn off the tap and apply the soap. You should lather your hands by rubbing them together with the soap, lather the backs of your hands between your fingers and under your nails. You should scrub your hands for at least 20 seconds. If you need a timer and you don't have one, you can hum the happy birthday song from beginning to end twice. Then rinse your hands well under clean running water and dry your hands with a clean towel or air dry them. If you want a fun variation on this um, that you want to share with others, there was a wonderful um, public service announcement that was done in Vietnam. And based on that, this uh, TikTok was developed. It's a very catchy tune. Or if you're of my generation, um, Gloria Gaynor, um, singing her song from 1978, uh, I will survive while washing her hands. If you don't have soap and water available, you can use an alcohol-based sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. And again, according to the CDC, you should apply the gel to the palm of one hand, read the label to learn the correct amount, Rub your hands together, rub the gel all over the surfaces of your hands and fingers until your hands are dry, and this should take about 20 seconds. So that's about getting COVID-19. How about spreading it? Well, clearly you should stay home when you're sick. You should wear a face mask if you have to be around others. You should cough into your elbow or cover your cough or sneeze with a tissue then throw the tissue in the trash and immediately wash your hands for at least 20 seconds. Make sure that you clean and disinfect frequently touched objects and surfaces daily. Why is it important to increase physical distance? For that, we can turn to what can be called a tale of two cities. Back in 1918, little over a century ago, when the country was plagued by the Spanish flu, Philadelphia and St. Louis took two very different approaches. St. Louis basically shut the city down. They closed schools, they closed churches, courtrooms, libraries, and they banned gatherings of more than 20 people. They staggered work shifts and limited riding on streetcars. Philadelphia, on the other hand, in an effort to boost morale, threw a parade for the soldiers who were about to head off to World War I. The parade drew 200,000 people. And days later, the hospitals started to fill up and more than 4,500 people died from the flu. Philadelphia ended up having more than twice as many deaths per capita as St. Louis. Another reason for increasing physical distance is the impact on the healthcare system. You've probably seen this graph before, but it's worth reiterating that without protective measures, we all risk having a very steep increase in the rate of infection to the point where this overwhelms the healthcare system capacity. 
We're seeing this in other countries like Italy and we want to really try to prevent it here. Just one more thought is that every day that goes by that we're preventing people from getting sick is a day closer to developing vaccines and a day closer to developing effective treatment for this virus. So how do you reduce your risk of COVID-19? Well, the first is to implement the recommended spread prevention. The second is to learn lifestyle medicine pillars. And thirdly, to make recommended lifestyle changes. What is lifestyle medicine, you might ask? Well, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine defines it this way. It is the evidence-based practice of helping individuals and families adopt and sustain healthy behaviors that affect health and quality of life. At Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute, we feel that there are nine pillars of lifestyle medicine. And those are nutrition, physical activity, avoiding toxic substances, optimizing sleep, managing stress, nurturing relationships, spending time outdoors, having a sense of meaning and purpose, and nurturing positive emotions and finding joy. We put this together as what we call the RLMI Wellness Wheel. So let's talk about each of the pillars. The first is nutrition. And we recommend moving as far towards a whole food plant-based diet as you can. So what does that mean? That means eating lots of green leafy vegetables. It means eating vegetables and fruits across a rainbow of colors. It means eating whole grains and legumes. Those are beans, peas, and lentils and eliminating all animal products. That includes meats, eggs, dairy, like cheese, butter, milk, and so forth. And why is that? Well, eating a whole food plant-based diet helps your health in multiple different ways. The first is that it very favorably impacts your microbiome. So what's the microbiome? The microbiome is all of the cells that we carry around with us that are non-human, mostly bacteria, but everything else. Um, and a lot of these hang out in our gut, but it's everything included, including what's on our skin and so forth. And when we eat a whole food plant-based diet, what happens is that we feed bacteria in our gut, in particular, that are helpful for our immune system, they're helpful for our mood, and they're helpful for our cardiovascular health. All three of those are targets that are important in terms of building resilience against coronavirus. When we eat whole plant foods, we eat a lot of fiber. Fiber is only available in plants and that fiber in turn feeds our microbiome and makes us healthier. Whole plant foods contain a whole huge array of micronutrients that help to really optimize our health. So a lot of different vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, all things that help with our immune system and cardiovascular health. And finally, a whole food plant-based diet is considered anti-inflammatory. So when we have an inflammatory reaction, we can reduce that through eating a whole food plant-based diet. The second pillar of lifestyle medicine is physical activity. 
Physical activity is clearly very important for your heart and lungs, for immunity, and also for mood. In usual circumstances, the CDC recommends moderate exercise for 150 minutes per week, and they recommend dividing this up into several sessions. So, for example, exercising for 30 minutes five times per week. But there was a large study of the Hong Kong flu that looked at the relationship between exercise and mortality. And what they found was that people who had low to moderate exercise, so up to three times per week, had lower mortality. And so the bottom line is that if you are used to exercising a lot, meeting the, the usual CDC recommendations, we would encourage you to continue doing that. But if you're not usually an exerciser, try to aim for gradually building up to 20 to 45 minutes of moderate, mild to moderate exercise three times per week. Don't exercise if you're ill because that will stress an already stressed immune system. And then also avoid contact sports and disinfect equip your equipment after use. The next pillar is avoiding toxic substances. So avoid smoking and avoid vaping or inhaling other substances. You don't want to damage your lungs and put toxic sub substances in your lungs um, if you want to build resilience against the coronavirus. You should also avoid alcohol to excess and avoid controlled substances. The next pillar is optimizing sleep. The majority of people in this country are chronically sleep deprived. We just don't get enough sleep. We don't make time for it. This may be an opportunity, if I can use that word, to change the way that we approach things. And so I'd like to suggest that you take the time to get enough sleep. Sleep is very important for your immune system. It's important for your cardiovascular health and it's important for mood. You should aim for getting seven to eight hours of sleep every night. And in order to do that, you should go to bed at the same time each night and plan to get up at about the same time every morning. You will sleep better if you're in a dark, cool, quiet, comfortable room. And it's a good idea to avoid screens within 90 minutes of going to bed. That will help to signal your brain that it's time, that it's nighttime and it's time for bed. The next pillar is managing stress. This is a time of stress for so many of us. And unmanaged stress raises cortisol and impacts the immune system. You need to find ways to reduce that stress. Some options are to talk with family and friends, ask them for help if you need it. This is not a time to be proud. Reach out if you need help. Practice mindfulness and meditation. If this is not something that you've done before, there are many resources that are available to learn how to do it. A few more thoughts about managing stress. Try to stay in the moment and be present. I think it's easy to try to anticipate what might happen tomorrow or next week or next month, but we don't know. Things are changing so quickly. And so to quote Mother Teresa, yesterday is gone, tomorrow has not yet come. We have only today, let us begin. And if you find that your stress is becoming unmanageable, please 
Seek professional help sooner rather than later. I thought it would be useful to incorporate just a brief breathing exercise that you can do pretty much anywhere and any time if you need it. This can help in the short term to reduce your stress. So if you'll do this with me, get comfortable, lie on your back in bed or on the floor with a pillow under your head and knees, or just sit with your shoulders, head and neck supported against the back of a chair. Close your eyes and then breathe in through your nose. Let your belly fill with air and breathe out through your mouth. As you breathe in, say in your mind, I breathe in peace and calm. As you breathe out, say in your mind, I breathe out stress and tension. Repeat this as you breathe in, say in your mind, I breathe in peace and calm. And as you breathe out, I breathe out stress and tension. Do this for five to 10 minutes and repeat as needed. The next pillar is nurturing relationships. And you might have noticed that I've talked about physical distancing rather than the commonly used term of social distancing because words have implications. And so I want to encourage you to practice physical distancing while socially connecting. To quote Rabbi Yosef Konefsky, language is a powerful shaper of thinking. And the very last thing we need right now is a mindset of mutual distancing. We actually need to be thinking in, exact, in the exact opposite way. Every hand that we don't shake must become a phone call that we place. Every embrace that we avoid must become a verbal expression of warmth and concern. Every inch and every foot that we physically place between ourselves and another must become a thought as to how we might be of help to that other, should the need arise. And so, please support and be supported by the people you love. If you're physically apart, use technology, schedule video, video chats, Schedule Zoom meetings. There's so many options these days for ways to connect, even if you're not in the same room. Be kind, listen to each other. Express your feelings. I'm sure you have a bunch of feelings at this point and listen to the feelings of others. Call friends and family and connect in whatever other ways that you can. The next pillar is spending time outdoors. And given our circumstances and how they're changing almost moment to moment, this may depend on your local circumstances. But to whatever extent you can, we recommend that you spend time outdoors. Being out in nature reduces stress, improves mood and sleep, it boosts your immune system. So walk with a friend if you can walk six feet away or walk alone. The next pillar is having a sense of meaning and purpose. There are areas around the world where people live longer and have a very low incidence of chronic illness. Those are called blue zones. And the concept of meaning and purpose is so important in these areas that several of them have special words uh, for meaning and purpose. So what are some of the things that you can do during these times to increase your sense of meaning and purpose or to tap into your sense of meaning and purpose? One thought is to try to help neighbors or others who may need a hand. 
you can look for programs that are supporting the community, and there are more and more every day. If you are religious, use the power of prayer. And as best you can, try to think of this as an opportunity. We are in uncharted waters, and this is a time for a reset. There's a quote that has been shared with me about this very concept, written by Kitty O'Meara, who's a teacher, writer, photographer, spiritual care provider in the hospital and elsewhere. And the people stayed home and read books and listened and rested and exercised and made art and played games and grew gardens full of fresh food and learned new ways of being and were still and listened more deeply. Some meditated, some prayed, some danced, some met their shadows, and the people began to think differently, and the people healed, and in the absence of people living in ignorant, dangerous, mindless, and heartless ways, the earth began to heal. And when the danger passed, and the people joined together again, they grieved their losses, and made new choices, and dreamed new images, and created new ways to live and heal the earth fully, as they have been healed. And the final pillar that I want to talk about today is nurturing positive emotion and finding joy. And it may, may feel like this is a difficult time to do that, but I would challenge you to, to try to find those moments. There's another quote that I like, which is, "'Tis better to light a single candle than to sit and curse the darkness." So try to be that candle. Try to find moments of joy and light, even if they're few and far between. One idea is to make a list of the things that you're grateful for. Keep it in a place that you can access easily and refer to it often. I carry a list with me in my cell phone, and I've had it for several years, and now I've got several hundred things that I can refer to and remind myself of all the things that I'm grateful for. And then finally, smile and laugh when you can and share those opportunities with other people. And in that spirit, I'd like to share a couple of things that have made me smile and given me a little lift over the past few days. Um, the first is this little guy, Wellington the Rockhopper Penguin, who is uh, a resident of the Chicago Shedd Aquarium. And when the Shedd Aquarium was, was closed, they let him out to wander around the, uh, the aquarium and look at all the exhibits. And so if you have a few moments, you can go on YouTube and look at how he uh, responds to, to seeing all of the different fish and, and others um, in the aquarium. It, it's really uh, very sweet. And the other one that I've been enjoying is Jimmy Fallon's challenge on Twitter to have people describe their experience with quarantine in six words. So that's hashtag my quarantine in six words. And uh, some of my favorites are couch bed, couch bed, couch bed. Day one, ate all the snacks. The naked chef at home edition. Very close to befriending a volleyball. And finally, expelled my kid from homeschool. So if you find these fun things, share them with friends, share them with family. Everybody needs a little lift at this point. And speaking of lift, we want to support you in difficult times and beyond. And so in addition to the programs that we're currently running, like CHIP and Jumpstart and our consults, we are starting the LIFT project. 
What is the LIF project? The LIF project involves 10 lessons given once a week. Each lesson introduces a scientifically proven way to lift your mood and your life from the fields of neuroscience, positive psychology, and lifestyle medicine. It's available through RLMI, and our support includes a weekly webinar for group support, regular emails that contain complimentary information, especially COVID-19 related, and a closed Facebook group for additional social interaction. Welcome to The Lift Project. It's an educational adventure designed to lift your mood and your life. Now, The Lift Project draws together the latest findings from positive psychology, lifestyle medicine, and neuroscience into 10 fun, simple, and fascinating lessons. You get to choose your own educational adventure, but for the best results, I recommend taking one lesson each week over 10 weeks. Each lesson you learn, experience, think, and share. To learn, you can choose to watch a fun presentation, or you can listen to an audio adaptation if you prefer to learn on the go, or you can read where you can dive deeper into the material and explore the science. Then you get to experience the learnings through challenges that I first demonstrate and then invite you to try for yourself. Then there are fun ways to think about what you're learning and experiencing and ideas on how to share it. Now I know that you will love what you'll discover in the LIFT project. It's fun, it's fascinating, and most of all, it's uplifting. So join me and let's live more. So in summary, following the pillars of lifestyle medicine can keep your immune system strong, keep your heart and lungs healthy, and keep your spirits up, which may help to avoid getting sick and reduce the impact of the virus. In every sense of the word, we are in this together. So please take good care and be well. And now I'd like to open it up for questions and answers. question that I saw was um, uh, the one about, you know, making the presentation available, which we certainly will. It, it'll be sure. available um, both um, uh, as a PDF and, and also, uh, you know, so that you can look at the, um, at the slides if you want, uh, but also uh, it will be available as the, the uh, video as well. Right. I did want to mention uh, regarding the LIFT program, when we run it, it will actually be meeting online twice a week, not just once a week. So if people want to do that, uh, they'll get lots of support. Um, I actually wanted to mention something about, um, now that it's springtime here in the Northeast, there's lots of wild greens out there. And well, that may sound a little crazy to you, um, one of my favorite things is to go out in the backyard and start picking wild greens, which are at least as healthy as uh, um, the ones you can buy in the store, if not uh, in more, uh, even richer in the uh, phytonutrients and antioxidants. So right now we have uh, the garlic mustard is coming up, which is a very common weed. And there's lamb, lamb's quarters will be coming up soon. Anyway, check it out online. Don't, um, this is not uh, a session uh, teaching you how to collect wild greens, but I think people should, uh, can certainly Google it and learn how to do that. So Susan, looks like there's some other questions. Yeah. Uh, um, so you know, the, there were um, a couple of comments earlier about others who are addressing the nutrition. You know, the, the nutrition piece of this is really, um, you know, critical. I mean, we, we think of it as, as one of the central pillars uh, of lifestyle medicine. And uh, certainly there's a lot of theoretical underpinnings in terms of how you can Oh, there's a picture of us. We're actually physically distanced, um, but uh, yeah, it's Photoshop. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> um, so, but uh, yeah, there there are several people. If you're interested in um, hearing more specifically about the nutrition piece of this, um, I know that Dr. Michael Greger in uh, of NutritionFacts.org uh, will be giving a presentation about that, and I believe uh, Dr. Scott Stoll from the Plantrician Project. Um, if you Google uh, either of those, uh, you should be able to um, uh, get more information about those, but th they'll be 
uh, going into a lot of the details um, of kind of the, the underpinnings of why uh, nutrition is so very helpful in terms of both uh, preserving your immune function, but, uh, you know, uh, preserving your health uh, uh, and the, the, the um, targets of, of this virus. Um, is it okay to... Sure, here's a comment from, uh, uh, so wild baby stinging nettles are tender and delicious right now. So yeah, nettles are delicious a vegetable. You just want to be careful you pick them with gloves because you can get stung. But once you cook them, uh, once you steam them, they're fine. Um, someone is, so people are asking about washing their fresh veggies. And um, what do you think about that, Susan? Hmm. Um, I you know, obviously it's important to wash your, <laughs> your fruits yeah, and vegetables. Right. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Do, do you have any other thoughts about additional, I mean, I, I don't know right. above and beyond just making sure, you know, obviously um, you want to make sure that there's no uh, visible uh, material left on them so that they're, they're clean, but then also to, to rinse them. Right. I also think if people are uncomfortable, they can certainly steam things. If you uh, cook them that way, that should kill off the virus. Oh, this is interesting. So for, uh, uh, people should understand that Dr. Freeman and I are not used to answering questions that, from people that we can't see. So <laughs> this is interesting. Okay. Um, somebody says, how do you wash a raspberry? So that's a great question. So a lot of the berries, like strawberries and raspberries, it's really hard to, to clean them. So if you think it's contaminated in any way, you probably wouldn't want to eat it raw for sure. Yeah. Um, there's a question about, is it okay to recommend to my patients to take hikes in the woods with their family? And uh, so, you know, um, one, uh, it, um, the, the short answer is yes. Um, if uh, if you're all living under the same roof, then, um, you know, you've been uh, sort of uh, distancing yourselves together. So that, that shouldn't be a problem. If you um, are living in different uh, homes, then um, I would say still, you know, maintain the at least six feet uh, uh, distance. But it, it's uh, the the woods and and um, outdoor spaces uh you know, uh, green plants have a lot of uh, um, good chemicals that they secrete. Um, by, they're called phytoncides, and uh, they help our uh, they help us to boost our immune system. So, you know, just taking a a nice walk in in the woods and taking deep breaths uh, is a a really good thing to do. Right, I um, can't recommend getting outside enough. Uh, fortunately, where we live, we're fairly rural, and I have access to good running trails and can get in the woods and go birding. And um, I'm actually feel like I'm storing up some energy for what may come. I'm a physician who may get called back into the uh, the fray. So um, don't feel guilty if you're not um, in the middle of a battle right now. I think it's time for people to save their energy, and uh, because we may need it later. So get outside as much as you can. Somebody commented here about getting lots of uh, vitamin D from sunshine. I think that's a great, great thought as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. A lot, a lot went, uh, went by very quickly. Uh, um, somebody, wa oh, somebody wants to, somebody wants to know how to access the lift program. If you just go to the, uh, Rochester lifestyle medicine Institute webpage and click on, um, the calendar, you'll, you'll be able to see, uh, see a, a calendar just devoted to lift. It's an uh, event list. A former classmate of mine from college. That's pretty cool. Um, there's a comment about fasting, and uh, you know, uh, intermittent fasting has has gotten a lot of press recently, and um, uh, the, you know. W I don't know um, that we know about specifically about COVID-19, but certainly um, there is evidence that intermittent fasting can 
um, help with boosting your immune system. Um, so uh, what, what does that mean exactly? Um, there, there are different uh, mechanisms of, of doing that. One, one is to you know, limit the time window that you're eating. If you are uh, doing that, we recommend uh, eating more of your calories early in the day and um, you know, short, shortening the window by stopping eating um, uh, earlier in the, in the afternoon or evening. Um, other, other options are to, to fast uh, for a 24 hour period um, once or twice a week. Um, some, some people do it that way. Right, excellent thought. So here's actually a comment uh, uh, from someone who says, going walking in the woods can be a problem if you're on narrow paths because you need to be prepared to walk six feet to the side. So I guess you have to step into the woods when you're passing other hikers. Uh, of course, I came from a lawyer, so I'm not surprised. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> very good. Thank you, Michael Dorf. Uh, here's someone who says he's uh, run every night at 4 a.m. and then been training for the seventh triathlon. Very good. Huh, that's and, great. And then, you have to, and then someone says you have to worry about ticks if you step in the woods. That's right. When you're out in the woods, well, no matter where you go, you should always check, check your, your ticks. Right. The, the usual pests, um, you know, haven't subsided, at least, you know, not so far, um, even with all of this. So, yeah, the usual rules, um, other usual rules still apply. Right. So what about risks of going to the grocery store? Somebody was asking about that. Yeah, yeah. There was actually a, an article. Um, try to, I think it was in the New York Times today. I will try to find that um, find that link when we send out our follow up email. Uh, but it it has a lot of sensible advice, um, you know, about um, how, how to kind of minimize your your risks. I mean, certainly. Um, I think a lot of, um, of, of grocery stores are doing things to minimize risk, you know, that mm -hmm. they're um, having um, times where older adults um, go by themselves, uh, you know, so uh, they can limit their exposure uh, to others. But, you know, things like making sure that you wipe down the, the handle of a, of a grocery cart, um, and um, you know, staying six feet away from others, trying to go at times where the, the grocery store is likely to be uh, less crowded uh, certainly makes sense. Um, usually, that's earlier in the day, um, uh, and a lot of stores now are are you know having are um, arranging their checkout lines so that people are standing six feet away. Um, mm -hmm. so, yeah. So here's a question about, uh, whether we should be recommending any extra vitamins. Well, um, <clears throat> I don't think there's any evidence that taking extra vitamins helps. Um, I'm a big believer in eating lots and lots of greens, uh, because they're full of, uh, phytonutrients that we don't even really understand. You know, nutrition is so complex that, um, we really don't know all the great things that are going on when we eat greens, but um, I would certainly emphasize that as opposed to trying to come up with some magic supplements, which often have um, uh, paradoxical effects that can be negative, actually. So, the, the uh, one, here, yeah, the one ahead. thing that I, I might mention is, um, you know, if if you um, aren't sure if your vitamin D level is um, kind of where it should be, you know, we live in a an area where um, a lot of people are vitamin D uh, either deficient or insufficient. Um, and uh, as a geriatrician, I see a lot of people who, um, you know, come into the hospital with fractures and, and mm -hmm. most, the vast majority of them are low, especially at this, this is the time of year to be low in vitamin D. So right. um, it probably wouldn't hurt uh, and may help to um, supplement with um, one to 2,000 um, international units of, of vitamin D a day. Right. I think that's a good point. And uh, I, I didn't want to give the wrong impression. I don't think there's any evidence that in this particular situation, we need more supplements. Right. But yeah. vitamin D and vitamin B12 are uh, supplements that we recommend for pretty much everybody. 
especially if you, uh, especially vitamin D if you live where we live and there's not a lot of sunshine. Um, and uh, just uh, if you're on a completely plant-based diet, then obviously you need to make sure you get enough uh, vitamin B12. And even if you're over, if you're over 50, even if you're not on a plant-based diet, you probably need to take B12. And vitamin D, uh, it's really hard to get enough sun. So, you know, one to 2,000 units of, of vitamin D every day would be a great idea. And it wouldn't hurt to have your vitamin D checked, your level checked, um, although it's probably probably hard to get that test now. So somebody's right. mentioned, right? right. Yeah, I, I, sorry, if, if I um, gave you that impression, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't go out specially to find out what your vitamin D level is. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. Right, yeah. I think the benefit versus risk is, is not in the right direction. But, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, someone here said mentions DHA. So for people that don't know what DHA is, uh, uh, that's one of the uh, longer chained, um, um, what's the word I want? Um, help me out, Susan. Um, omega-3 fatty acids. Fatty one of the longer chain. Yeah. Uh, omega-3 fatty acid DHA, which you can get actually as a, uh, uh vegan supplement from Amazon is a DHA, uh, EPA supplement. Um, and I don't think the science is really great on that, but, um, it's, it's something that it's one of the only supplements that I actually use. And uh, I'm not sure I have great scientific evidence for that, but I think it's not bad. Uh, someone says they're eating oranges like crazy for more vitamin C. Um, that's great. Uh, I, it's great they're eating oranges. Um, don't necessarily drink orange juice. Uh, we really encourage people to uh, eat the whole food. Uh, so eating a whole orange is uh, going to be better for you than drinking too, uh, a lot of orange juice. So that's great. Uh, what else? It's a lot of things about how to save the chat. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, great recommendation uh, regarding vitamins and supplements to read Whole by T. Colin Campbell. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, Whole is a wonderful book. Uh, T. Colin Campbell uh, wrote The China Study, and uh, Whole uh, kind of goes into the whole uh, issue of uh, reductionism versus holism and how important it is to understand that nutrition is extremely complicated and that if we try to outsmart Mother Nature, we usually get it wrong. So it's better just to go for the... Uh, the whole food rather than try to figure out what you can extract from a food. So let's see. Uh, the lift program uh, is going to start Saturday morning. Uh, the first one, I think, is at 10 a.m. If you go to our website, it'll show you. It's a really fun program. I think you'll really enjoy it. Um, a question about zinc supplements. Um, well, I don't really have great evidence for that, although... Go ahead, Susan. Yeah, I mean, I... I think there's some theoretical um, evidence supporting it, but I, I'm not sure that it's ready for prime time, especially as related to the uh, coronavirus. So right, um, right. yeah, I, I think, again, I, I feel like this is a um, field that is moving very rapidly. And there are so many groups around the world that are really trying to find uh ways to, you know, reduce the impact, reduce the severity of illness, et cetera, et cetera. And um, you know, so hopefully in the coming days, weeks, months, we'll, you know, have a lot more, um, evidence based recommendations, uh, to, to be able to, mm -hmm. to give you, right. um, yeah. Right. There's a, um, nice, uh, chat entry here from our friend, uh, Margie Roswell, who says she wrote a book, I'm sorry, wrote an article called, uh, antiviral nutrition. Uh, we haven't read that, so we can't endorse it, but you can certainly uh, take a look at what she's uh, included the link here. So I think that would be really interesting for people to take a look at. Um, that, uh, Robert Cohn is asking if I'm still growing my own garden. I actually am, uh, ran out of time to plant my garden. I know, uh, Robert, you've seen we have a really large garden. It's all weeds at the moment, but I did think uh, about a few weeks ago that perhaps civilization was crumbling. So I went and bought a whole bunch of seeds at Lowe's. And uh, so I'm ready. I'm going to start it up again this year. Uh, although I think we're going to have plenty of vegetables. <laughs> I don't think civilization is actually crumbling, but, you know, every once in a while, yeah, I, I, yeah, I get stuck on something. So um, any other comments here? Oh, are there statistics being collected regarding whole food, plant-based, no oil versus standard American diet? 
Uh, is, and so the question is, are there statistics being collected regarding whole food plant-based uh, and no oil versus standard American diet? Uh, not that I'm aware of as far as the um, uh, COVID-19 epidemic goes. I, I'm not aware of that. Uh, we have had people, uh, we've received some uh, inquiries from people who work, uh, nursing, nurses who work in ICUs about what kind of uh, nutrition they should be dripping into their patients' feeding tubes and whether it should be sort of the standard dairy-based one or whether there is uh, anything they can do with a plant-based one. And there is a company called Kate Farms that produces a plant-based nutritional supplement that's meant for tube feedings. That's Kate Farms if people want to look that one up, uh, especially if you're a medical person uh, looking for something to put through a, a feeding tube. Susan, anything else? Mm. Okay, let's see. Okay. Well, it uh, looks like the questions have stopped here. Oh, lettuce grows like weeds. I grow a dozen different varieties. That's also from Robert Cohen. Thank you. Yep. Uh, this is the time to plant your lettuce. Uh, there's a few things you can plant now while it's still cold. So lettuce, spinach, beets, peas. Any specific suggestions for herbs or spices? All herbs and spices are great. Uh, we love cute. Um, and, and a variety. Right, a variety, um, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, the question about how to get our CDC to share this message. Um, <laughs> that's a great one. <laughs> yeah. But we'll take suggestions on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Email us your suggestions. Do older adults have a more difficult time with coronavirus due to stronger immune reaction? Should people just use Tylenol or not, et cetera? Um, I, you know, I think there, there is some concern about, um, using non-steroidals. Um, mm -hmm. Again, it's, uh, I don't think it's been um, uh, that, that we have a, a final word on that, but in the interim, I, I would say uh, Tylenol or acetaminophen is, um, you know, probably your safest bet. The, the other thing that I would say is if you have a, you know, if, if you have a mild case of this, um, and you're you're treating it at home. Um, fever is is the body's way of dealing with viruses. So um, unless you are feeling really toxic from a really high fever, um, I would encourage you to try to not try to bring your temperature down un unless mm -hmm. it gets you know really unbearable. Um, make sure you hydrate well um, if you you know if you do have a fever because you have your your um, insensible losses increase but uh um yeah i mean you want to use your immune system it's it's a message that your immune system is is working to try to you know get rid of something mm -hmm. right so there's some questions about what we uh, how we feel about treating the virus and we're not going to get into that because we're lifestyle medicine doctors mm -hmm. and um i don't think anyone's got some really good answers there's a question about whether we're created super viruses with all the use of Purell and other antibacterial soaps. Uh, again, probably not something we should get into here. Um, a question about if you get the virus, what to eat, what to what do. To yeah, Susan, what do you think about that? Um, well, I, I would say, um, I, again, sort of hold to the principles of eating um, a whole food plant-based uh diet that lots of greens, lots of good vegetables across the spectrum um, of color. Um, you know, if, if you're not feeling well, you may feel like not eating as much and that's okay. Um, uh, make sure you drink plenty uh, so that, uh, you know, that, that helps just kind of keep things uh, flushing through. It helps with your, your respiratory uh, system to to kind of uh, move the the mucus through and and that kind of thing. So um, you don't want to get dehydrated. Right. Yeah. I think that's important about the not getting dehydrated. You're gonna make sure make sure you get lots and lots of fluids. It'll help you feel a lot better too. So you know even getting some kind of a like a pediatric electrolyte solution to just you know drink a lot. Make sure that your urine is clear. Uh, if your urine is getting dark yellow, you need to be really drinking a lot more fluids. So anything that can get fluids in your herbal tea would be great. Um, so, okay.
What do we recommend as a non tax you see? So it is eight o'clock. And Susan, unless you have anything else you want to discuss, no. I think we're gonna wrap, wrap this up. Okay. Yeah, well, well thank, thank you. you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all for, for coming and Susan did a great job. I really appreciate your video. Uh, it was fabulous. So thanks so much. Take care. Bye bye thank everybody. You. Appreciate it.